Welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Peter from the Australian Energy Market Operator with six QA, tool, QA tools that'll make your Python code better. Take it away, Peter. Thank you and welcome. Who's this talk for? The AMO team in this case study write critical enterprise code that executes on a lock, lockdown servers in the cool room. We are very, very conservative. I'll be advocating you spend about 45% of your dev budget on code QA. This may not be for you, but we'll proceed anyway. Before I start, I have a question, and the question is a question. What is the hardest question for a coder to answer? Give some thought to that as I scroll through the next few slides and we'll talk about that more in a moment. First of all, can you spot the bug in this code? Probably not a fair question because you haven't seen the context. But you can see that it opens a text file, it iterates over it, it pulls out, gosh, uh, column number six, it adds the value to a list, it sorts it and it prints it out. What's the whole point of that? Well, here's the underlying data. Now, this is uh, typical market data that we deal with at work. It's available on the public internet, and it shows the generation in megawatts against each generator in the NEM at a point in time. At the point in time, we do this every five minutes. The columns of interest are F, value we call do it or dispatch unit ID, we call a generator a dispatch unit, and column G, scatter value, uh, which is the megawatts that that unit is producing at that point in time. You can often reverse engineer where the unit is in the country by looking at the name. Uh, CAPTL underscore WF, for example, on row whatever it is, six, is Capitol Hill Wind Farm outside Canberra. Eyeballing the data, you can see the lowest value is around about negative um, 0.02 and the highest value is around about 620. Back to our code. It opens the file, it iterates it, it pulls out column 6, it adds it to a list, it sorts it, and it prints out what we think is going to be the first value and the last value, the minimum megawatts and the maximum megawatts. And we get this minus 0 0.0015 and 97. The answer's wrong. So where's the bug? This is perhaps the worst sort of bug you can get because it executes, it produces a number, but the number's absolute nonsense. So what we need is a crutch to lean on to help us not make this error. Let's get a bit smart now. We'll introduce a class structure to help us, a class structure to lean on or a different coding style to help us avoid that error down the track. And of course, the error was that we're adding our numeric values as a string to a list and sorting as a string, and strings and numbers sort differently. So we're getting the maximum and minimum value based on the fact that it's a string, not a number. Let's inject some code that forces it to be a number. So I've created a class, line uh, 8 in the code, called GenVal. It has two attributes, doid and scatter value. Doid's a string, scatter value is a number. It has a dunder lt method, or a magic Python method that will help us sort this class, where it compares the two scatter values. It does its iteration. Uh, line 21 creates an instance of the class. Line 22 uh, sets the doid, line 23 sets the value, it sets it as a decimal, so we're getting smarter now. It uh, does its sort, and it prints the maximum and minimum value, but it's still wrong. So can you spot the error in this code? Again, probably not a fair question. But where we work, scatter value is a value that's used all over the organisation in many systems. And it's, it's a word that we hold in our heads and we probably translate it without even thinking about it from one form to the other. So line 11 is scatter value. Line 23, we're assigning it, is scatter underscore value. And of course, beautiful, infinitely 
elastic permissive Python will just swallow that and will create SCADA underscore value as an attribute on our class without complaining. So we need a crutch to prevent us from that error. More code. Can you spot the error in this code? Again, these are three errors that I have made a hundred times, and they are errors my team has made a hundred times. The error in this one is a result of copying and pasting the headers from a CSV into my code, uh, entering some carriage returns, and then reformatting it so I'm mapping CSV columns into object attributes. And I inadvertently left a trailing comma on line 23. Now, a beautiful permissive Python will just swallow that, except it will set our SCADA value to be a tuple with one value in it, rather than the actual value itself. I've changed the context of the code slightly. It's now not looking for the maximum and minimum values, but it's trying to sum the generation available at that um, uh, time period. And of course, this code will actually blow up on line 28, because it's trying to add a tuple to a number. This is, this is a, a less worse error than those previous ones, because our code won't execute. That's a good thing. Anyway, we've had three hard-to-spot bugs in trivial code. These bugs would never have occurred in a compiled language like Pascal, which is my background, or C or C Sharp, as the compiler would have caught them. What happens when the body of code grows? What happens when the number of coders on your team grows from 1 to n? And what happens if you're simply having a bad day? Back to the question at the start of the talk. What is the hardest question for a coder to answer? In my experience, it's this. Are you done? The answer always comes with a caveat. Yes, I'm done, but I haven't finished the unit test. Yes, I'm done, but I have some documentation to write. Yes, I'm done, but oh my goodness, I have to refactor this module over to the side. What we want is an objective, unambiguous definition of done. Something that we all agree to. It's something that all your team members agree to, to allow this question to be answered. The tools we're going to talk about are these six. And they're going to help us answer that question, are you done? The tools are iSort, Black, PyLint, MyPy, PyTest, and Coverage. We're going to look at each one and look at the changes those tools will make to the code as you execute them. iSort is the first one, and it's the simplest. This is the blurb off the iSort website. iSort is a Python utility or library to sort imports alphabetically and automatically separate them into sections by type. That's all a bit ho-hum. Uh, you can implement the same behaviour as iSort will give you with Control alt something or other in your IDE. Um, it will sort your imports, it will get rid of the ones that aren't used, it will eliminate git noise. That's the main reason for use this. You're not going to get any git conflicts in your import section when you've used this. Install it, use it and move on. Black takes over your life a little bit more. Black is the uncompromising, uncompromising Python code formatter. By using it, you agree to see control over the minutiae of hand formatting. In return, Black gives you speed, certainty, and freedom from Git noise, that Git thing again. Black will save you time and mental energy, freeing you from more important matters. Let's have a look at some code before and after we execute Black. So a little fragment of code that parses that uh, text file with the generator class has been run through black and it's done two things to it. It's injected a blank line ahead of the class definition. That's a pep 8 thing. It's a bit ho-hum, but it will solve git noise. Um, and it has reformatted the dunder string method that I've added to my class. I started off with a long... Uh, long line of code that spanned, I don't know, 80, 90 characters, and Black has wrapped it for me, and it's wrapped it for me in a consistent way. A little bit ho-hum, perhaps, but again, it will get rid of git noise and will stop arguments over formatting styles within your team. It also allows you, as you're coding, 
to just type any old nonsense, run it, get the thing working, and then hit black, and it's formatted for you. So it actually, it does save a lot of time because you don't have to stress over, do I enter a carriage return here or should I be continuing on the line? Again, black, a little bit ho-hum, install it, use it, move on. PyLint is starting to get a bit more interesting. PyLint is a, is a Python static code analysis tool which looks for, form, looks for programming errors. It helps enforce coding standards, it sniffs for code smells, and it offers simple refactoring suggestions. Now, a good IDE will give you iSort, Black, and PyLint support. This is PyCharm, and you can see line six, there's a squiggly yellow line under my class uh, definition. If I hover the mouse, it tells me PEP8, E302, expected two blank lines, one found. Well, that's easy to fix. Uh, and it tells me another one, class names should use camel case convention. Okay, that's a little bit harder to fix. You've got to control or whatever the rename is in uh, PyCharm and change that class name all through your code. PyLint will run in the IDE, as I just showed you, but also run as a batch script outside the IDE, and we do both on our project. PyLint will give an error message like this. Uh, it's the file name followed by the line number and the column number. You can copy that to the clipboard and control alt something or other in PyCharm and it will take you to the exact location. It gives you a numeric um, warning uh, message um, ID. It gives you a human readable message description and then it gives you a text-based message ID also. You can use that text-based message ID to suppress this form of warning by inserting a comment into your code. Here are some PyLint messages from our sample code. The first one trailing new lines, it's a bit ho-hum. Uh, the second one disallowed trailing comma tuple. That's interesting, that's a real bug that PyLint has spotted for us. That absolutely needs to be fixed. Uh, the next one, redefining built-in sum. Okay, so the word sum is a Python library thing. I have a variable that clashes with that, so that should be tidied up. Constant name input underscore file doesn't conform to uppercase naming style. Ho-hum, but let's fix it. Uh, missing doc string. Uh, we have a rule on our project that all classes must have documentation. Um, PyLint wants a higher level of documentation than that, but we've wound that back um, to only requiring documentation for classes. And there's a couple of other ones that are getting into the um, uh, semantic thing rather than hardcore bugs, but we have a policy of tidying them up anyway, because that noise could be hiding something like our trailing comma that actually matters. PyLint keeps track of your progress between runs with this message here. Your code has been rated 10 out of 10. Previous run, 99.98 out of 10. It kind of gamifies the quality process. So our team members collectively get this wonderful surge of happy hormones as our, as our um, progress tracks towards 10 out of 10 or 100%. Here's a fragment of code before and after PyLint. Uh, before and after the human intervention to correct PyLint errors. Again, bit ho-hum, I've changed the name of the uh, input file variable to conform with PEP8, all uppercase. I've changed my class name to Pascal case, and I've inserted a comma, a comment. A comment. PyLint allows you to write custom linters, and we do this quite a bit on our project too. One of our staffing patterns is that we rotate our power system engineer graduates through the team, who all come with coding skills, but not necessarily enterprise type coding skills. And during peer reviews or, or um, peer reviews of the code, we found ourselves over and over again explaining, look, please don't build up a file name like that, use Python's pathlib, or please don't create a Python class like that, use a data class. Or please don't concatenate strings like that, use f string. So we have a series of 
custom linters that PyLint executes that supports the new coder towards our coding standards and relieves time during the peer review process for matters of architectural significance rather than just how did you concatenate a string. Before and after running the custom linters, a code looks like this. Uh, the input file now has become a Python path object. Um, because it's a Python path object, we can open it as a file and iterate it using a slightly different uh, Tursa syntax, as shown on line 26. And we've created an instance of our class using the new uh, format where we're passing important data into the constructor on line 30. MyPy is where things start to get in more interesting still. MyPy is a static type checker. You anote your code with type hints, and MyPy will check for bugs caused by type incompatibility. Here are some typical MyPy messages. Function is missing a type annotation, or incompatible type assignment. Some code before and after, we've run it through MyPy and manually made the necessary changes. Our Dundas LT method has got some type hints now, so the uh, other attribute, that's, or the other argument that's passed in must be of type gen, and it must return a Boolean. While we're here, we've created a generic based list of our generators, so we can pass this, we can use this list in our code without having to um, uh, type the list differently all through, our, um, all through our code as it grows. And we've created an instance of our list of the correct type down the bottom. PyTest is a unit test framework for Python. The PyTest framework makes it easy to write small tests while scaling to support unit integration, regression, testing of a full program suite. Now, to run PyTest against your code, you're probably going to have to change the structure of your code. This is where the tools really start to take over your life. The code was initially a large script. Um, execution would start at the top, it would work through to the bottom, and the lines at the bottom would be the entry point and would call the code procedurally, one line after the other. That is very hard to unit test code in that style because you don't have a thing that you can grasp hold of and pass around. You can't uh, create an instance of it in your unit tests and poke it with the testing uh, patterns. So we break our code from one file into four. We start with a, um, an entry point file no, called Dundas main in this case. We have a file that contains the unit tests, test underscore gen in this case. We have a file that contains our data, test underscore bomb, a naming standard we use on our project. Bomb means business object model. And then we have a file that contains the behavior, uh, gen to total. So the pattern we use is that we separate data from behavior, nouns from verbs in our code. Our gen bomb file contains the code that we created earlier on in our big procedural script, uh, definition of our gen class, and the definition of our gen list. Our behavior has been wrapped up into a class called gen to total. It has a, it has a entry point called execute. Again, a standard we use across our team. If you have a class that contains behavior, it has an entry point called execute. Execute takes a single argument passed to the input file, and it returns a single value of, des of type decimal, which is the um, sum of all the generations for that trading period. As execute grows, you can break it down into a number of methods that are private to the gen to total class. You've got to do what you've got to do for readability. Our entry point, nothing remarkable here. If name equals main, uh, create a reference to the file that we want to read. In reality, you might want to parameterize that somehow. Create an instance of our gen to total class. Execute our gen to total class. Grab the value, print the value to the screen. Nothing remarkable there. 
our test code looks like this, using the PyTest um, standard. We have a container class called test gen read. PyTest requires the first part of a class that's part of a test to be capital T-E-S-T. -E it has a method or a bunch of methods on it that can execute our test code. PyTest requires test underscore whatever as part of its naming style. Line 21, we're creating an input file with known data. Uh, that variable content contains three lines of text that sets up our input file with uh, values that we have control over. Line 20 contains a PyTest fixture called tempPath. tempPath is a path to a temporary folder that PyTest has created for us, and PyTest will take responsibility for cleaning up. Uh, we create an instance of our gen to total class on line 25. We execute and capture the value, and then on line 28, we compare the value against an expected answer. And our test passes. And of course, we have many, many tests like this in a production body of code. Again, to, execute, to, to work in this way, we must refactor our code. And just a reminder, the, the pattern is we have an entry point, we have tests, we have data, and we have behaviour. Coverage is the last tool in the suite. Coverage is a tool for measuring code that is actually executed in Python. Coverage monitors the program while it executes, noting which parts of the code have been run. It produces a report listing code that could have been run, but wasn't. A coverage report on our, fragment, on our test code looks like this. You can see we've got coverage of 93% and we're missing lines 8 to 11 of Dundas Main. How are we going to hit those lines? Things start getting a little trickier. The code at the top shows the entry point as we coded it early on. <coughs> If name equals main, create a reference to the file, an instance of the reader, execute it, print the answer. We need a way of grabbing hold of that code in PyTest and poking it. <coughs> so to achieve that, we've wrapped it all in a method called main. Same code is just contained in a, in a function called main. And the entry point calls that function on line 14. This allows us to write a unit test like this. We use Python's import lib module to import our Dundas main file as if it was a module. We then use Python's mock library to change the name of the Dundas name attribute on that file to main. We then hit the main method, the main function in that file. PyTest has another fixture called Capsis, which will capture anything that's printed to the screen. So line 35, we're reading the contents of what was printed to the screen. It gives you two outputs, what was printed to standard out and what was printed to standard error. We check the contents of standard error against our expected value, and our test passes. Coverage now reports 100% coverage. Now, there'll be a question within your team. What level of coverage is sufficient? When we started this, we had our unit test and we had almost prod quality code. We had a coverage of around about 95%. We all pulled our efforts and spent a day and we got it up to 98%. And then we did some soul searching. How far do we want to take this? because we're spending our employers' money, and to reach that extra 2%, we're starting to spend serious money. But we liked the challenge, so we decided to give it a go. So we time-boxed it. We said, by the end of the week, if we don't have 100% coverage, we're going to back off and lower our quality standards. But we achieved 100% coverage. There were some patterns we had to nut through, particularly that how to hit an entry point. But this has become our quality metric from that day forward. Code doesn't go to production unless it has 100% coverage. 
Do I have to do this, really, is often asked by the new members of our team. This is seriously expensive. And the answer is absolutely yes, you have to do this for our code base. For many reasons, but one is that your code will last a long, long time. December 17, 1999 is the birthday of the system we support. It's 23 years old and the code that was written prior to December 17, 1999, Pascal code, is still in production and is still producing value for the organisation. So we write our Python code as if it's going to last 25 years or more. What's the lifetime spend on QA? AEMO's AMP code base, the project I work on, now has 71,000 lines of production source. It has 52,000 lines of unit tests. That's around about 40% of our code is unit tests. Back to this question, the hardest question for a coder to answer. Are you done? We now have an unambiguous, objective way of answering that question. I sort is clean, black is clean, PyLint is clean, MyPy is clean, you have unit tests, and coverage is at 100%. We can talk about the cost of peer review, user acceptance testing, load testing, cyber testing, integration testing, usability testing, and all those other things you do before you're truly done later. But this is a tool for the coder. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. We have some time for questions. Yes. Yeah. Did anyone have a question? Um, do you uh, maintain the same level of uh, checking for products and related issues? How do we? How do you fix those? In case. Say that again, if you could. Uh, in case there is a products and related issue, and you need to. Uh, push a change rather quick? Uh, yes, we do. Um, we have a Git repo, of course. We use Git flow, so we have a series of branches. We have feature branches, hot fixes going on, uh, release branches. If we have a prod type quality, we'll create a hot fix. We'll implement the fix. Um, this is absolutely a quality metric that everything that goes to prod has to has to go through. Um, you think it's an overhead and it's a burden and it's going to cost more than it saves, but because we have this, we're able to implement that prod fix very quickly. Um, Looks like we've hit our definition of done, no questions. I think so. <laughs> Thanks so much, Peter. It was a lovely talk. Thank you. Thank you very much.